Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jason. Thanks so much for that. I, uh, uh, you may or may not know this, but uh, as pastors, we do listen to other people preach sometimes. And uh, when I go running, my favorite guy to listen to is Jason. <laughs> uh, even though he's been recently quoting some not great song lyrics, uh, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. We'll f- you can figure it out later. But uh, it is a great blessing uh, to uh, be here with all of you celebrating 10 years of Lighthouse Bible Church of Orange County. I know it is the witching hour for the children, and so <laughs> i try to cut out any of the frivolities here and uh, <laughs> just speak to you a little bit from the Word. Um, but it is a joy, and there are some deep connections here, actually. It's fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm pastoring a church called Faith Bible Church. That church was planted by John Coe and his brother Joe Coe. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think they were at VKCC with you, John, uh, like many years ago. Uh, so you guys have, uh, the, the, the roots run really deep between our churches, actually like profoundly deep uh, between our churches. So it's just a neat blessing to get to be here and see God's hand at work uh, in the church here. And uh, I've only had a front row seat to see your church uh, over the last uh, few years from the, through the eyes of Jason. Uh, But it is very evident, I think, to everyone that God's hand has been on this church, not only in the last uh, 28.3%, but uh, in the last many years, right, over the last decade, that God has really uh, worked in the church here, and it's been a great joy to see that it's evident that God has led you all uh, to the place that you're at. So uh, anytime you reach a milestone like this, you have two options. One is to look backwards and talk about God's faithfulness, and the other is to look forwards. And so I chose to look forward uh, praise God, uh, because you guys all talked about God's faithfulness, which is great, <laughs> but uh, I decided to look forward a little bit, um, and it's always a little bit nerve-wracking to preach in front of pastors. I feel like uh, this is like the assembling of the Avengers here, and so I should not be up here, but here we are anyway, so there's nothing we can do. Um, so I, I, I decided to preach on a text that is very dear to my heart. It's actually the first sermon, the first text that I preached on at FBC when I came back from India. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. So if you, would, uh, if you have a Bible on your phone or something, look at it. It's, it's better if you look at the text. It's never helpful to just take my word for it. Uh, just look at the text. It's better that way. Um, and as you're turning there, uh, we, of course, none of us knows the future. We don't know the future of anything, right? I don't know the future uh, or what will become of our church at FBC and don't know the future of uh, Lighthouse Bible Church of Orange County or the state of California or our nation. But one thing we do know with certainty is that Christ will build his church, right? He certainly will, and that the universal church, nothing will prevail against it. Amen? So how do you live with that kind of victory in mind when you don't actually know the near-term future? How do you live with that kind of victory? And that's where this text is actually so profound. I think it's so helpful for us. Um, I, I want you to think about what happens in your heart when difficulty comes. Uh, whatever comes in the future, what, what t- where do we tend to turn in times of difficulty? If you're like me, when things get hard, I sometimes start to feel a lot of self-pity. Uh, I don't know if you guys turn towards self-pity sometimes, but I do. I start saying things in my head, like the inner monologue, uh, this isn't fair, right? This just isn't fair to me. Why did this have to happen? Why isn't this or that happening for our church the way that I had planned? Why is this so difficult? And I think we all have this sort of response sometimes. That's one possible response. Another one is to sort of circle the wagons and try to maintain as much semblance of control as I can. Uh, I try to fight for control that way. Or even at times, I find myself growing more and more selfish. I start thinking things like, doesn't anyone understand? And I forget about other people. And That's when things are hard, but even when life is good, it's easy to let the blessings of the world start to take control of our lives and hearts or to let other influences control us. But in the text that we're going to look at uh, tonight, uh, Paul is calling his readers to actually look away from ourselves. He wants us to look away from ourselves, uh, whether positively or negatively, and to look to Christ and to live for him. In fact, just read this with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, Paul says this, He says, the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now, I just want to take this apart piece by piece. There's really three chunks in the text here. And the first is uh, what we're going to call a powerful control. Uh, Paul says in verse 14 that the love of Christ controls us. 
The love of Christ controls us. It's an interesting phrase, right? Uh, the word that's translated control here is suneko in Greek. It has the sense of constraining something or encompassing something. It's a word that's used for the banks of a river that keep the river from going outside of its uh, trajectory. And Paul is saying that we are controlled or constrained or hemmed in by the love of Christ, Obviously, Paul's not talking about our love for Christ. He's talking about Christ's love for us, that the love of Christ becomes this controlling, constraining power for us. That's what Paul's talking about. We know this, right? Jesus loves us, doesn't he? This we know how. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? The Bible tells me that Christ loves me. And Paul is saying that the love of Jesus in his life that he embraced in the word of God is the most powerful, compelling force in his life. The fact of the love of Christ for him is what controlled Paul. It controlled everything that he did. Obviously, we can be controlled by a lot of things, right? I'm often not controlled by the love of Christ. I can be controlled by my fears, right? The fears of the future, fears of danger, fears of sickness, fears of elections, fears of financial troubles, all of those things, right? Maybe that's true of you. Maybe you could ask yourself that question, right? Am I anxious about tomorrow? Am I stressed out right now about something? Am I stressed out about how long this guy's going to talk? <laughs> we can be controlled by our fears, right? We can also be controlled by our own selfishness. Selfishness can be an incredibly powerful control in our hearts. We can make decisions based on what would feel too good to us at any given moment or what we really want. We live in a world with so many choices. Sometimes we can start to think that life is like a menu at a nice restaurant and everything is really about us and our desires and our choices. Is that true of you this evening? Ask yourself this question, who do you think about the most? What do you, who are you thinking about when you make your financial decisions? Who are you thinking about uh, when you think about you and your spouse? Are you filled with self-pity about how your life is unfair? Are you obsessed with how you look or what you eat or what you own or a hobby that just dominates your time? Sometimes we can be controlled by those things. We can also be controlled by what others may think about us. Right? We can live our lives thinking all the time, what would people think if I did this or that, right? Fearing what people might think of me. We can worry that people are watching us or judging us, and that becomes a controlling influence in our lives. Maybe that's true of you as well. Are you worried about what people think? Do you serve at church or serve your spouse or do good things, all the while wondering how people will view you as you do those things? profoundly introspective? Do you crave acknowledgement for what you've done? And that's just three examples, right? Those, that's just three. Those came out of my heart. Those are the areas where I fail often. And there are many other things that can become controlling influences in us. And all of us struggle with these. We have competing desires, competing emotions within us all the time. But Paul here says that the most powerful controlling influence in his life was the love of Christ. That's a fascinating verse because the subject of the verse is what? It's the love of Jesus. The thing that's doing the action in this verse is the love of Christ. Paul's being acted on from the outside. And the love of Christ is controlling him and moving him. Doesn't that sound awesome? Don't you want that to be true of you? you could, where people would say, the love of Christ controls this person. The love of Christ controls me. I, I want to grow in that. I do. I want that to be true of me. My question is, how did Paul get there? What did God do in his heart that changed him from being controlled by fears or selfishness or people to being controlled by the love of Christ? What did that in his heart? And what does it look like to be controlled by the love of Christ? So we're going to look at those two things. First, what did God do in Paul's heart? And then secondly, what did that look like in his life? And the first, so that brings us to the second observation in this text, a pervasive conclusion, a pervasive conclusion. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, the love of Christ controls us having concluded this. So Paul has come to a conclusion, right? And what is the conclusion? He says, uh, verse 14, that one died for all, therefore all died, 
This is fascinating. Paul tells us that the constraining reality about the love of Christ, uh, some people, commentators believe this is actually a creed from the early church, that the constraining power here was the truth of the death of Christ. Christ died for us, his people, believers. Jesus died for you. Uh, That's a remarkable statement. Even if the world was full of perfect people and you were the only sinner on the planet, God would still have sent Jesus into the world to die for your sins. Think of that. God chose you. He elected you. He adopted you. And he sent his son to die for you. That is the love of Christ. That's his love for you. And that had a result, right? He died for all. And then Paul says, therefore, all died. All died. Paul says that those for whom Christ died are now dead. We're in a room full of dead people. We are the walking dead. We are spiritual zombies in a sense, right? And he says that he died for them. He died for us. So he's not saying, obviously, that we're physically dead, because notice what he says in verse 15. He says, and he died for all so that they who live. So so he's saying, you're alive, and yet you now have died. What does he mean? That those who are alive are now dead. The answer is that our sins... Our old selves died with Christ at the moment of our salvation. I want you to think about this really. I think sometimes we can skip over this so quickly. But if you're here and you're a Christian this evening, the moment that you put your faith in Christ and repented, all of your sins, past, present, and future, died with that old sinful self that had committed those sins. They're dead. They're gone. Even the sins that you'll commit tomorrow have already been forgiven completely in Christ. That's how much he's done for you. And we know, right? Because the wages of sin is what? It's death. But in Christ, the wages for our sins have already been paid. They've been paid in full because Christ died for us. No matter if you're the newest believer here, or if you've been walking with Christ for decades, that is the best news you could ever hear, isn't it? Because we know our own sins, don't we? When you really look inside of yourself, you know that you sin and fail, that we fall short of the glory of God, often the way that we ought not to. And yet those sins are forgiven because of what Christ has done for us. And of course, what motivated Jesus to die on the cross for you? What motivated him to die for you? There's one answer, and that is his love, right? He loves us in that profound of a way that he would give himself up so that your sins could be forgiven. And in loving us that way, what happened? He glorified his father in the most profound way. In that reality of his love for sinners like us, he brought glory to God the Father in the highest possible way so that in the ages to come, we would glorify God, Paul says, for his grace and kindness to us in Christ. Now, I I assume most of you are believers, but if there's anyone here who does not know Christ as their Savior, I just want to tell you uh, this evening that the wages of sin is death, and that the death that you deserve, you will pay for every sin that you have ever committed. It's still on you. You are still under the divine and just wrath of God. But the glory of the gospel is that right now you can have the penalty of sin and death taken off of you. You can be forgiven for your sins and be forgiven through the death of Jesus on the cross. If you'll trust him, you'll believe that truth. Now notice, Paul says he has concluded this, right? He's concluded this. What What does he mean when he says he's concluded this? It's a conclusion that Paul has come to in his mind. He's reasoned to a certain place, and he has come to a conclusion. He is 100% convinced of this. And that's what Paul says. He believes this with all of his heart. He believes that he is dead, that he has been united with Christ in his death and forgiven for all of his sins. That is the great conclusion of faith in the Apostle Paul. That's what he's telling us here. So we've seen how Paul has come to a conclusion regarding his own death and how the love of Christ on the cross is what is controlling him. And we could stop there, right? We could stop there because we could just say, this is true of you. 
the love of Christ for you at the cross that you see when you know your sins and then you know yourself forgiven controls you and you can be more and more controlled in that way. And Paul could have stopped there, but he doesn't. And this is the third thing I want you to notice in these verses. And this is a purposed commitment, a purposed commitment. I went to the master's seminary, and so everything has to be alliterated. Uh, A purposed commitment. Notice what he says in verse 15. He says, and he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That's what he says. Paul tells us something really wonderful about the purpose of Jesus in your salvation. What was he doing? This is an amazing statement. He says, he died for all so that. This is remarkable. Paul is giving us a window into the mind of Christ. Jesus was thinking this, that there is a purpose in the mind of Christ. Christ's great purpose in saving you. And what was it? it tells, he tells us, doesn't he? saying those who have died with Christ at the cross, that God has this purpose for you. That they who live, we who are alive, might no longer live for ourselves. Christ wants us to be radically different. Radically different people. No longer consumed with ourselves and our fears. No longer consumed with our desires or what people think of us. No longer consumed and controlled by all of the things that can so easily control us. He doesn't want us to be controlled by those things. Instead, he wants us to be done with all of that selfishness. He wants us to live for him. That's what he wants. When you first read this, when I first read this, I was inclined to think, that's odd that he would say that, that we would no longer live for ourselves, but what about for others, right? Philanthropy, why don't we just live for other people? But Paul doesn't say that, because Christianity is not primarily a philanthropic religion, primarily. Yes, we love others, and we're called to give our lives for others, and yes, of course, God wants you to be selfless and kind and generous and love one another in the church and consider others more important than yourself. That's all good. Those are good things. But he knows that philanthropy, that kindness, that selflessness is impossible without a greater motive, something deeper, something more powerful. And so he says that we might no longer live for ourselves, but for him who loved us and gave himself up for us. Jesus wants us to live for him and for his glory. He wants us to live moment by moment thinking of him, thinking of his glory, of his will, so much so that our lives are lived through Christ as though Jesus were living in us and coming out of us. And that's true, isn't it? Christ dwells in us by faith. And the way that that controlling influence comes to us, Paul says, is that Jesus rose again on our behalf. By rising in power, in the power of a new life, that new life now lives in you. It's inside of you. Christ is inside of you. The power to change exists in each of us because Jesus is alive. Amen? That's a wild thing. And he lives inside of each one here who knows Christ. He flows in us and moves us to live for him as we see his glory manifested in his love for us in dying on the cross for our sins. That is the great purpose of Christ in our salvation. So I want you to take a little test with me here, okay? A little test. Are you living this way? Are you living this way? Just examine your heart right now. Are you living for Christ and for his glory? Can you say with the Apostle Paul, the love of Christ is what's compelling me? The love that Jesus has for me is what's compelling me to live. Do you serve in the church for Jesus and his glory? Do you love others for Jesus and his glory? And as a church, is the glory of Jesus at LBC driving, the the driving motivation of what you're doing? And listen, we all fail this test. We all do. Sometimes, don't we? 
If we're honest, we all fail this test. All of us do. But the best news of this passage, the best news you could possibly hear is that the test is rigged. It's rigged. We all fail. We can't do this the way that we should. But the, our failures to live for the glory of Christ, the way that Paul calls us to in verse 15, are already dealt with, aren't they? Where are they dealt with? They're dealt with in verse 14. The love of Christ controls us because Jesus died for our failures to live for his glory. You're already forgiven. <laughs> in fact, you will make mistakes. I will make mistakes. As a church, you will make mistakes. You could leave here today and not live for Jesus and his glory. And if you're a believer, you could even fail all day long and stumble all over the place in living for yourself. But if you know Christ as your Savior, what will Jesus do? He'll maintain your forgiveness, won't he? On your very worst day, Jesus loves you. He loves you. He's already died for all of your failures. He's died for those competing, controlling influences. And you are completely forgiven and safe in Christ. Now that is remarkable news, isn't it? That's remarkable that Jesus loves us that much. And that becomes the great motivation. The single great passionate motivation for each of us is that. If you're convicted and you realize, I'm living a selfish life in some ways. I'm compelled by all these other things. Just come to Jesus in your heart. Tell him you're a huge sinner and ask him to forgive you. And what does he say? He doesn't say, do penance and I'll receive you. When we come to Jesus and we say, Lord, please forgive me, what's his answer? He says, yes, I forgive you. I died for you. It's done. Now, live for my glory. Live for my glory. And what will that look like? It's very simple. You'll love God because of how kind he is for you. We will love him. Why? Because he first loved us and sent his son to bear the wrath for our sin. And you will love others. You will love, you will love and adore and commune with Jesus. And you will love and serve and help and care for others for Jesus' sake. In a church of people that are doing this in increasing ways, a church of people that are seeking to be compelled by the love of Christ and to love one another and to love Jesus together, that will bring glory and honor and praise to Christ, won't it? That will bring glory to Christ. And this is my prayer for you. That's my prayer for you. And it's my prayer for our church, really for all the churches that are represented here. I know this isn't new, but my prayer for you and for my church and for all the churches here is that the Holy Spirit would do that work in our hearts in ever-increasing ways to remind us just how much we are truly loved by Christ and that we would grow in being compelled and constrained by that love to love him and to love others, that that would become our controlling passion more and more. And that as you fail, you'll help each other come back to that glorious reality that we are loved and forgiven, that you'll keep each other on that same path in serving and living and loving one another for the glory of Christ. That's what Paul wants for us, isn't it? That's Paul's vision for the church, is that we would be compelled and constrained and controlled by the love of Christ so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. Amen? Amen. Let me pray real quick. It'll be done. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word Lord, we thank you for the truth of the gospel, things that we would not believe were they not written. Uh, they're so remarkable. Lord, that even our failures to love you as we ought are forgiven in Christ. Lord, that we are loved, that we are loved in the most profound way. Lord, that we have been granted access into the throne room of heaven so that we can see your glory in this truth that you love sinners like us. Lord, we confess, all of us, that we are not compelled by the love of Christ as we ought to be. Lord, that we have not been constrained as we should be.
But Lord, we thank you that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Lord, we thank you that your love for us shows us the glory of our Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that you would cause our hearts to be satisfied knowing we're forgiven right up to this moment and that we are now empowered through the Spirit to live for him who loved us and gave himself up for us. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for LBCOC. Lord, we thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for uniting these people together around the gospel of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would fill them with a deep and growing knowledge of the love of Christ for them. Lord, use their leaders, use their elders, and use the body here for the sake of the glory of your Son. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.